Welcome back to Everywhere Radio, friends. Whitney Kimball Co. here. I hope you've had a wonderful summer. We've been busy over here at the Rural Assembly welcoming two new staff members, Libby Lane and Tane and Fothering Gill. And we presented our summer virtual gathering where we were introduced to more than 600 registrants from 49 states. That's right, I did say 49. I'm not sure what happened to Rhode Island. If any of you listening to this podcast out there are from Rhode Island, please drop us a note. The Rural Assembly is a national movement of rural leaders and their allies, and we can't leave anyone behind or any state behind. And if you missed Rural Assembly Everywhere, you can go back and rewatch every bit of it at ruralassembly.org. Today, we're kicking off our new season of Everywhere Radio, the podcast that spotlights the good, scrappy, and joyful ways rural people are building a more inclusive nation. Over the last three years, we've talked to journalists, policy officials, poets, organizers, musicians, authors, faith leaders, and more. All incredible people who bring wisdom, humor, and a big old dose of we'll figure it out to their work every day. This season on Everywhere Radio, I'm excited to share that we're expanding the conversation by welcoming a rotating cast of radio hosts from the Center for Rural Strategies Constellation. You'll get to enjoy interviews hosted by our president, Dee Davis, and our new Assembly Deputy Director, Libby Lane, among others. So let's kick off this first conversation in our new series. It's a doozy and it's so timely. It's an exploration of how rural people are feeling about the future, about our economy and about our democracy. Please enjoy this interview between Dee Davis and political pollster, Celinda Lake. Hi, uh, today I'm here with my pal, Celinda Lake, a real um, a legendary uh, pollster and one whose um, work I've followed for, for years. I don't want to say how many years, but just, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really been so beneficial to us in our rural work. And, and in the past year, we decided to take on a project looking at perceptions of rural economy, how people in uh, rural communities were feeling, what they were, what they were uh, looking at in terms of values, uh, ideas for policy, and and we needed help, and so I reached out to Celinda, who's been great and helpful in this this process, and and I would just like to say first of all, uh, welcome. Uh, Selinda, thank you for thank you. Uh, being here. And and also, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, the way we think of rural people and the way rural people think of themselves. I know a lot of times I hear uh, rural people described as looking backwards or nostalgic for a uh, time gone by or for some other era. And and that seems different from what I see in my life and what I see in rural communities. What I see is people who are very much in the moment and are looking to make a contribution. They they care about uh, work, feeding their families. They care about their community. They, care, they think of themselves as the, those who feed and fuel the country, fight the wars, and they're looking for ways um, to be of service. Now, maybe I'm romantic and maybe I'm uh, nostalgic, but I, I find that it's helpful occasionally to move past the romance and try to get some data. And you've been very helpful in getting this data in this most recent poll where we've begun to look at not just the politics of rural communities, but also uh, look at what people are valuing, what uh, and where they uh, imagine that the trajectory for their communities. Yeah, thank you, Dee. And it's really exciting to work with you. And uh, I want all your listeners to know that I share their Uh, commitment to rural America, having grown up on a ranch in Montana. um, And I think you're exactly right. I I think the romantic view is kind of uh, 
laughable, actually, because people are working really hard. They're working hard for their communities. They're working hard for their families. They're working hard for the future of their children. They're working hard for the country. Um, and what I love about uh, this poll is that we really asked questions to get beyond the surface. And we looked in depth at concerns and values and then support for policies. And what I loved about it was that the poll was really defying a lot of conventional wisdom and a lot of these kind of romantic myths. So when we looked at what people were really concerned about, the number one thing that they were concerned about was the cost of food uh, and the rising cost of living uh, in general, but particularly the rising cost of food. And that's really ironic because, of course, we're talking about the people who produce the food for everybody else's table. Uh, so there's a certain irony here. Um, it's like, um, you know, oil uh, drillers worrying about the gas price of gas. Um, and so... That was really interesting. And then followed by a whole host of rising costs and gasoline, health care, which is a big issue in rural America. <clears throat> and people think that health care costs are going up. One of the things that I think is really, really interesting about rural America is that they, you know, we have a time series now. We have data over time because uh, rural strategies invested in looking at these voters over time. And there was a time when concern was much more immediate about jobs. And now it's really about wages and what those jobs pay and um, uh, whether you can just meet the costs of living. Even if rising prices go down, will they go down to what they were before? Will wages keep up? And rural America is really pressed in that regard. The second thing we looked at, which I love, is values. And the number one value in rural America was family. Uh, and that's not surprising. 31, 35% of the voters said, this is one of the mo two most important values to me. But right behind it was freedom and 31%. And having grown up in Montana, um, we're very definitely uh, freedom-oriented voters. Uh, I love the fact that people, it used to be that um, only, that freedom was very politicized and a lot of progressives and Democrats didn't use, didn't talk about the value of freedom. And now we're all talking about freedom and recognizing that there's a lot of uh, policies out there. If you've got CEOs in another state determining the prices of commodities or the shipping rates, you don't have the freedom to thrive for your family. If you've got um, ideologues deciding whether or not uh, what health care policies are, you don't have the freedom uh, to make your own dis personal health care decisions. If you don't, uh, if you've got people banning books, you don't have the freedom to say, I want my kids to learn the good and the bad of our history. I want people I want my kids to be prepared for the future. So we've really taken back freedom, and that's uh, the second top value. Uh, at a distant third is faith, and I think that uh, faith is a very, very important value in rural America. It is interesting that it has been um, become more partisanly polarized. So a lot of independents and Democrats don't mention faith as much, even though uh, I think you um, uh, looking, you know, people are really, uh, faith is very important. And my dad used to say on the ranch, um, you always believe, you always believe in the power of prayer when you're in a foxhole or when you're looking at a thunderstorm on the horizon and you're trying to cut that hay uh, and get in before that thunder or hail hits that hay. So uh, I think that it's too bad that that value has become more partisanly polarized. And I hope we see some of the trends that we've seen with freedom where everybody gets to own that value. Also important are personal responsibility and safety and security, but family and freedom are really dominating and they're dominating for every group of people. Let me pause there because there's also some really cool data on the policies that people supported, but there's a lot of richness to what we've discussed already. And I want to make sure that uh, your listeners get all their questions answered and, and what you're thinking about. So, yeah, I, um, on this idea of partisanship, I, I'm, I'm, I know in 
Um, speaking to Deb and Jim Fowles about their Our Town work, it was interesting that they said that if they began by asking people what political camp they were in, that the communities just put on their uniforms, uh, divided up uh, in these camps. But if they talked about what work the community needed done, where the community uh, had problems or had issues or where, where they could be of service, then you had a different conversation and people came came together. I'm, I'm just interested in, we know, we know in the last 20 years, um, rural communities have become more Republican, uh, where Clinton and Gore won rural voters. You know, we see now more and more uh, Republican votes, but I'm interested in those values or indicators that go beyond partisan lines. Can, can you tell me what you saw there? Yeah. So what we saw was people really clustered around uh, a set of orientations to improve life in their communities. And, um, you know, um, I often laugh that as, as people on, on this, listening to this program know, when you've got a crisis, when you've got a sick family member in rural America, when you've got a crisis and your barn burns down, People don't ask each other, is that a Democratic family? Is that a Republican family? No, they cook the covered dish and take it over. Uh, they they join and bring some wood and, and re-raise the barn. They go look for the cattle that got out. And so I think that's a really, really important piece of rural America is that they want to come together and solve these problems and work for problems that are affecting everyone. We saw in um, the uh, policies that people, the things that people really wanted to join together on, they felt that they really needed to reduce inflation and make things more affordable from gas to groceries, prescription drugs, the cost of living just too expensive for rural families. And rural incomes are just not keeping up. And that's true even though people have added multiple jobs. I mean, you've got People on the farm now doing the phone bank for the credit card company and everything else. And in Montana, where I'm from, we were number two in the country, not in people who had two jobs, but people who had three jobs. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a lucky person that's only got one job in rural America um, and doesn't have a couple of side hustles and an SD account. Um, so I think that people really, the, the income is really, and the opportunities really aren't keeping up and people are worried about what's going to happen for their kids. Um, we also saw that there was a real populism in rural America. And of course that has a really long tradition and people felt very strongly that wealthy corporations are not paying their fair share or what they owe and that they have rigged the system against small town and rural America. And when you've got Amazon and, and Bezos paying zero taxes, um, that's really a problem. They need to pay what they owe so that we have the money to invest in our schools. And uh, rural America has long, in our healthcare systems and our veterans programs and our seniors, rural America has long paid what they voted and invested that money. Um, I went to a public school in rural America where half the kids that I went to school with did not go on to college. And I think I, I got one of the best educations in America that prepared me for Ivy League schools. Um, so I think that people are really wanting to come together, wanting to look for community investments, uh, wanting to look for the things that promote real freedom and real fa thriving families and real freedom. And we saw just a number of things that are, are really, really strong with people. We'll be right back after this from The Daily Yonder. Hi, I'm Anya Slepian with The Daily Yonder. Check out The Yonder Report, a weekly podcast rounding out the latest rural news. Produced by The Daily Yonder and Public News Service, you can listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to Everywhere Radio. It seems like to me that in the, in the earlier polling that we did about a year ago, we we saw um, some despair. Some people just worried about 
um, not just their kids or the community, but themselves. You know, usually yeah. when you do these kinds of polls, people say, well, I'm okay, but I worry about my kids. But in what we've done in following up, it seems like there's some um, some of this policy response that is more hopeful, that's more communitarian, is more about uh, where rural can go from here. Yeah, we really saw that. And I think, I like you, uh, Dee, really, really felt positive about that. The despair before was really unnerving. I mean, it was depressing to read the polling data. And people were really feeling, um, you know, there weren't opportunities and things. They were on the edge. Now people feel the possibility of moving forward. And they think there are policies that will move their communities forward and their families forward. And they're frustrated with a political system that isn't responsive enough. But they can see uh, a, a future. And we have a saying at home, um, they can see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train coming your way. Um, so in terms of policies, it was really interesting. People really want to create manufacturing jobs. And there was a time when people thought jobs are not coming. Manufacturing jobs are not coming to small towns. They're not coming to rural America. Now people think they could be. And they really got some optimism about it, and uh, some, and particularly in small towns, and creating manufacturing jobs in America and in small towns, um, the people thought was their number one policy, and they didn't just like it like a little bit. They were like at sixty and seventy percent, thinking that this is doable. This is a top policy. This is something I want to see. People were adamant about lowering prescription drug prices. And uh, the insulin piece, of course, rural America has ha has fought for a long time high di diabetes rates. And the price of insulin was always very salient in rural America and in rural states like South Dakota, one of the highest states in America for diabetes. Um, so that getting that price down and there are a lot of rural communities that are along that Canadian border. And I know. Um, you know, coming from Montana, you can drive across the border and get these drugs at one tenth the price. That that something's wrong when that's happening. People have long in rural communities known that the VA was negotiating lower prices, and they wanted Medicare to negotiate lower prices too. Of course, a lot of veterans coming out of rural America, and so their families are aware that you can use the clout of of joining together to negotiate lower prices. People really want to improve their local schools. I think rural America, it's, it's not well understood if you're not from small town in rural America. Rural America has always invested in their schools. They have always thought, if, the, if our kids can't stay here, we're going to make sure they're well prepared if they have to leave. And so people really, really want to improve local schools. And um, people of color in rural America, and rural America is white, but there are a very significant population of people of color, they really, really want to improve the schools. Cracking down on price gouging, rural America's populist, uh, you know, from hating the banks to hating the railroads to hating the conglomerates. Um, and uh, people know that um, there is price gouging out there. There is price fixing. There is monopoly behavior. Rural America has, has always had a very sophisticated understanding of how the economy works uh, and about how monopolies and oligopolies work and the little guy in that. And they want to crack down on price gouging. They also want to close tax loopholes. They feel there is, um, they're worried about government spending, but they're worried about taxes going up. Taxes is real money in rural America, as it is in urban America, and people want to make sure that everybody's paying what they owe. Everybody's paying their fair share. So uh, so people might not like big shots, but they kind of like each other, right? I mean, there is... <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Uh, although it's really funny, um, the Democrats and independents uh, think they are completely surrounded by Republicans. <laughs> so they may keep the yard signs down, but they do like each other and uh, they do like their neighbors and they like them and they go root for them together at the girls basketball game and they go coach them together in the baseball game in the spring and they 
have the Fourth of July parade where they cheer every little everyone's kid who's dressed up and waving a flag, and then cook a hamburger together. So yeah, uh, they do like each other, and uh, they also don't. I think in um, rural America, there's a lot of um, we should look for common ground, and there is a lot of common ground, and we should stay out of each other's business. So, so I had a buddy uh, who's who uh, his his philosophy in life was that God's in heaven and he's watching down and he's watching a lot of people shoot pool and he over and over, he sees the people go up and shoot that straight in. But once in a great while, he sees somebody have that straight in and pass it up for a three rail bank. And I'm just wondering, uh, you've seen a lot of polls. Uh, were there some surprises? Were there some three rail uh, banks here that you weren't expecting? I was really surprised, although in retrospect, I should have known it, but I was surprised that freedom tied with family for the top value. Um, I've known that, but I was really surprised to see that data because um, family is super important in rural America. I was flabbergasted at the high numbers for the policies. I was just floored because these are a lot of policies that people say, well, those are socialist policies. Those are democratic policies. Um, and um, rural America thinks they're just sound policies for the future of the country. And I was surprised, I was so pleased and surprised that from really being so despairing that people were like, we can see our way clear in this. We can see our way forward. Let's join together. Let's get some of these policies passed. We all agree on this stuff. Right now, we, we talk a lot about, um, and we, I mean, everybody's talking a lot about the health of democracy, democracy in peril. And then we're seeing issues like um, um, school bathrooms and what library books and a lot of these kind of weaponized, nationalized issues. I'm interested in, are there, are there values and policies that you see here from this poll that would be helpful to people working in, in uh, locales, you know, as a way to build a common purpose? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, um, uh, the, the desire to have good schools. Um, people do not want to undermine their schools in rural America. They really want their kids to have a good shot. Um, the second thing I think is that um, people do not like this. We don't know from your poll, but we know it from others. People do not like banning books um, in rural America at all. And uh, they have fought for that freedom uh, to have, um, not to have books banned. People have always felt, um, you know, you can make the choice for your kid. Sure. You know, you don't want your kid to read that book. Sure. Opt out. Don't, don't check it out of the library. Um, and, but no, don't tell my kid what I want them to read. I may want my kid to read something different. And um, people know their teachers in rural America. They know their librarians. It's hard to vilify them because <clears throat> they're the people that um, uh, really help out. And, um, uh, you know, the, the teacher may be married to the rancher next door um, in rural America. And a lot of the early homesteaders were teachers. And uh, one of the funnier quotes we heard um, when we were talking about taking books out of libraries and... Uh, this one person said from rural America in another project we were doing, you know, how radical can a librarian be? Don't they usually just go around and tell you to read a book and be quiet? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, like, these are not communists sitting in the middle of rural America. They're telling you to be quiet and read the book uh, or helping you find a book when you're really excited about books. Um, and I think most rural Americans remember when they went. I remember when I went to town and got my first library card. I was prouder of that than almost anything, <laughs> including my college diploma. Um, so yeah. I think that... Um, uh, people want, um, and, and they really want their kids to have a good start. They really want their kids to have opportunities so they don't have to leave rural America. If they choose to leave, that's one thing, but they don't have to leave. Uh, so I think people, uh, and the other thing I think is that people think 
you know, it is a lot bigger problem. Um, it's like our governor in Montana said decades ago when we were talking about marriage equality. And he once said to, on a, on a statewide radio address, he said, aren't you a lot more worried about the price of grain on the high line than what, who marries whom in your next door neighbors? And it's like, yeah, good point. Governor. I am a lot more worried about the price <laughs> of grain on the high line. Um, so I just think that obviously people have values and they want their values respected. But um, this stuff is, uh, I think people think is really out of control. And uh, we know that talking about economic issues beats these wedge cultural issues because this is not a big problem. So um, I, I, I once read someone talking about science as standing in the light and reaching into the darkness. So now that you've gotten a chance to uh, look at this data, where do you think, where would you want to go next? What is it now that, you, now that you've seen uh, these responses, you've seen the values, you've seen people thinking about what policies would work? Is there a part that you now say, gosh, I wish I could explore that? Uh, yeah, the thing, I, and you asked the right question. I, these policies, I believe, are way more popular than these cultural wedge issues. And I would love to see uh, a little, uh, an experiment done where we put up the economic message, we put up the youth opportunity message against some of these wedge messages. And my bet is we beat them overwhelmingly, including with conservative folks. Um, and I think, so that's number one. Number two, I would like to ask uh, the underneath question like, okay, you don't like X, Y, or Z, but how much of a problem is that in your community? Do you like your local librarian? Like, how much of a problem is she? Um, and didn't your teacher, you know, one dad in a focus group said to me uh, when I was exploring with him what book your kid reads, and he goes, you know, I just don't have this problem. My teacher constant, my kid's teacher constantly keeps me informed of what book my kid is reading. And frankly, my concern is, I want to get the kid off the phone and reading a book. I just want them to read something. That's my problem. And the teacher's helping me with that. They're not hurting. They're not making this a problem. Um, well, now you made me remember going to the library for the first time and checking out uh, Buzzy Plays Midget League Football. I, I think that was one of the, the highlights of my childhood. So. <laughs> Well, Selena, I want to thank you. This is wonderful to get a chance to talk to you. And I do want to find ways that we can share the yes. story circles, uh, the focus groups that we've done. And, um, and I hope that we get a chance to do more of this exploration to really look at uh, how these kind of... Um, policy aspirations can uh, be presented in a way and can be lifted up. So maybe we can do that together. Uh, it's fun working with you. It's wonderful working with you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. And thanks to all your listeners for uh, the wonderful things that they do to support our country. If you enjoyed Everywhere Radio, we'd love for you to consider subscribing to the General Rural Assembly newsletter, where we promote new offerings from the Assembly and amplify the good work of our many partners across the country. Just head over to ruralassembly.org to sign up. If you're a true fan of Everywhere Radio, please let us know by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. And if this isn't your cup of tea, no biggie, that's fine. We'd like to thank our media partner, The Daily Yonder, and let you know that Everywhere Radio is a production of the Rural Assembly. Our senior producer is Joel Cohen. Our associate producers are Teresa Collins and Anya Slepian. And Susanna Brown is our assistant producer. You can be anywhere, we'll be everywhere.